Clients with PTSD, how to help them. This is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis blog. In this video, I'm going to offer some information about how I work with clients who have been diagnosed with PTSD, and also some tips on how you might help your clients. I'm gonna go a little bit into the science and also go into my own personal experiences. By the way, I just released a video last week, why PTSD is not a disorder. So I would highly recommend watching that video first on the Provocative Hypnosis channel before you get into this one. It will kind of outline the framework and everything I say will make way more sense. So make sure to do that before you proceed with this one. So let me offer you a, um, a little test question. Let's say that someone has gone through a life-threatening event where either their own life was in danger or perhaps the life of a colleague or someone they love was in danger or perhaps even died. A, a highly unsettling event. Given two different options, what would you do? Option A is to do what's called critical incident stress debriefing, meaning that you, as soon as possible, sit this person down and have them go through a three or four hour detailed interview where they talk, verbally go through every detail of the event as they can remember it, you know, their thoughts, their feelings, what happened, where the whole idea is to, you know, get everything out so that one does not develop PTSD later, or option B, just offer social support and uh, check in. And if, if the event still bothers the person a month later, have the person sit down four days in a row, 15 minutes per day, and just write down their deepest thoughts and feelings about the event. No counselors, no psychologists, no professional help at all. Given these two options, which would you choose? Most people would choose A, better to prevent, right? Better to get at this early so that they don't develop PTSD. But actually, you would be wrong. You see, debriefing after events have been used for decades all over the world. Police officers, military personnel, ambulance responders, people of the Red Cross, all sorts of organizations um, have had their personnel go through debriefing after uh, allegedly traumatic or life-threatening incidents. And the thing is, you know, pretty much everyone has been convinced that this has been useful. You know, quite often the people themselves have uh, reported that they found this very useful and the people involved with it, the people who conduct the debriefing, ha have also been very positive about it. But now, or not now, we've had it for a long time, but but there's been a lot of studies where you have a control group who don't go through the debriefing and you have people who go through the debriefing. And the meta studies show that not only does debriefing not work, but in many instances, it actually makes things worse. The, the people who go through the debriefing are way more likely to develop what's called PTSD than the people who don't go through the debriefing. And there's a lot of research that shows that if you get someone to sit down, if, if they're still bothered by it a month after the incident, to, to get down and get down, sit down, and, and write 15 to 20 minutes per day, four days in a row, uh, you know, th their deepest thoughts and feelings about the event, that that actually helps most people. Now, why is this? So the first thing I'm gonna say then is don't do debriefing and don't start to meddle with people's memories too early. 
you are likely to do more harm than good. So what, what might be, you know, what's likely going on here and this is important if you work with someone who has a PTSD diagnosis. As I made clear in the previous video, PTSD is not a discrete mental disorder. Uh, it's, it's not a dysfunction or disorder of memory. Uh, there is way more to support that what you call PTSD is more in the realm of what you could call emotions of adaptation, a, a bit like homesickness or grief or someone who's been betrayed or cheated on in a relationship, you know, something like that, emotions of adaptation. So the first thing to keep in mind is that it is quite normal and natural for people to who have gone through very serious events where their life has been in danger, or they've had the perception that their life has been in danger, or they've seen someone else die or perhaps almost lose their lives, that it is quite normal for people to go through a period of emotional adaptation where they might be hypervigilant and they might be living in fight or flight and they might have anxiety and their, their, their minds might be ruminating and trying to fill in the gaps. This is likely just our inner system trying to process what happened and make meaning out of it. And most people, if you don't get in the way of that process, will do just fine. So it's really important for those people to know that their emotions are normal, it's healthy, it's not dangerous, it's perfectly okay, and that what we call the mind has self-correcting capacities. You know, we have an intelligence inside of us that's constantly working to keep us essentially healthy. So let's say you scrape your knee or you get a cold, you know, if you leave it alone, you have an intelligence inside of you that's going to orient you back towards health and balance. But if you keep picking on it all the time, you know, you, you might very well get in the way of it. So instead of viewing PTSD as something to fix or something to heal, it's more important to communicate to people that they do have innate health, innate mental health inside of them, and that what they're going through is normal. It's, it's a natural process. And if people get stuck, it's way more useful to look at what might be getting in the way of that self-correcting process continuing or completing on its own. That's where you get the most bang for the buck. So one thing that's very often useful is that writing experiment that James Pennbaker pioneered back in the day. And one reason why that's very often useful is that the brain is trying to like fill in the gaps and trying to make meaning out of something. And sometimes people are not quite able to organize their thoughts or to create coherent meaning out of something. And they just get stuck in this loop, right? And what seems to happen with debriefing is that people kind of freeze the memories and solidify them. And, and that kind of blocks the natural process of processing things. So by actually sitting down and writing, you help someone to make their thoughts concrete, to contextualize them, to take a step back, to get perspective on them, and to reframe what happened. You know, give it a new meaning, find some uh, narrative or some story that allows the mind to conclude. So that is often a, you know, a useful thing. Um, other things that are useful are of course being engaged in life, uh, you know, having good quality relationships, um, helping someone to find the meaning in what they have been through, you know, finding the value in it so that they can grow and develop psychologically as human beings. 
as a result of it and perhaps even use it for something positive. Um, now, here, here's something that's really important to know, and that is that all emotions are okay and all thoughts are neutral. And when I say that all thoughts are neutral, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially saying that no thought comes with some secret sauce, with some secret ingredient that says, look, if this thought shows up, you have to feel absolutely horrible, or you have to engage in these destructive behaviors, or you have to keep ruminating and spinning. So when people get stuck with thoughts, it's very useful to help people to develop the capacity to relate to thoughts in different ways, learning how to see thoughts as thoughts. Because what really happens is that people have thoughts and then they too easily get absorbed into them and they lose track of the fact that they're thinking. And then they try to solve the thoughts as if, as if it's an event, right? But you can't think your way out of overthinking. You're just adding more thinking. So any exercise that helps people to either kind of get distance from their thoughts so they can watch their thoughts, or any type of exercise that helps them to really know thoughts as thoughts. I've very often had people deliberately think the typical thoughts that emerge and training them to know that they're thinking as they're thinking. Training them to be aware of the larger contexts and having thoughts emerge as just one object of experience so that they have perspective and proportionality in relation to thoughts. Um, helping people understand memory more accurately. You know, very often people think that they're reliving past events and, and that memories are stored in the body and that there are these repressed traumas. And those beliefs contribute to the perception of inescapability as in, I'm just stuck with this. But I have found that educating people on how memory works, how it's reconstructed, how you never really experience a past or a past event, but a thought in this particular moment, and that any thought in this particular moment is actually a new thought. The question is just to what extent is that seen? So, I teach this stuff a lot in my psychological illusion model. Outside of that, you know, people who teach metacognitive therapy, people who teach acceptance and, and commitment therapy, uh, various NLP techniques, you know, all of these things can be useful to change your relationship to, to thoughts. Um, one common denominator with people who do develop these PTSD symptoms is high hypnotizability. And, and uh, you know, people who have a high hypnotizability have a strong capacity for dissociation. So hypnotic rituals then can be a way of, let's call it a controlled dissociation. So people like David Spiegel have done studies where they show the correlation between high hypnotizability and a PTSD diagnosis. And, and they often help people through self-hypnosis where you train the body to float here and to project your thoughts onto an imaginary screen over there so that you can practice thinking the thoughts without getting stressed in the body. So these sorts of things can be very useful to help people lose their fear of the thoughts because they're no longer in the war zone or in the robbery or in the mugging or in the rape. They're just thinking and getting lost in these thoughts. Uh, something else that might be getting in the way is just a, a tendency of hypervigilance, you know, of being in fight or flight and looking for dangers and interpreting signals from the environment and from the body as, as signs of danger. So helping people to feel into what's happening in the body and to disconnect 
the automatic stories that a beating heart or a dry mouth is connected to danger is very useful. You know, this is where various meditation techniques can be very useful. Also, if someone's hypervigilant, you know, they're, they're doing threat detection, they're looking for threats all over the place all the time. What very often keeps this going are beliefs about rumination and worry, you know, like positive beliefs, like, you know, if, if I only can remember exactly what happened, I can prevent it in the future. Or if I'm only, if I'm only hyper vigilant all the time, I can avoid this from happening again. So helping them look at what beliefs they have about processes like rumination and worry can be very useful in helping them turn these things off once they have an embodied insight that these things aren't really working. You know, people might also have negative beliefs like, you know, the, the, the fact that I have this thought means I have a brain disease or the fact that I keep, you know, reliving the rape or thinking about it somehow has to mean that I want it and I'm a sexual pervert, you know, or, or you know, pe pe people might come to all these sorts of conclusions and then think that they have to get to the bottom of it and think their way out of it. Uh, pe people may often, you know, think that the, the fact that they feel a particular way or think a particular way means that they're a bad person or that something's wrong with them that they need to figure out. Um, this is where exploring the kind of beliefs they have about their thinking can be extremely useful. Sometimes people are have been kind of naive and they're, they're stunned by how you know, other people can behave the way they do, you know, after a betrayal or something horrible has happened, or they've found themselves in a situation where they have done something that they didn't think was in their repertoire. And they, they think it means that they're evil or, or uh, they're, they're unable to, to make sense of it, you know. So also here, helping people to see through uh, the impersonal nature of thinking and feeling can be extremely useful. Uh, something else that very often keeps this stuff going is, you know, avoidance behaviors. You know, people get really reluctant to go certain places or they, they always exit the scene if they hear a particular sound. and. These, these sorts of, I'll give an example, and this is not a PTSD client, this is a fear of flying client I worked with not that long ago, but, but he said, you know, I'm, I'm like 85% okay, but I can very easily be 100% okay. And what I need for that to happen is um, I need to book a special chair in the flight, uh, I need to check the weather, I need to have one beer at the airport, and I ideally should have a morning or evening flight, so I'm not reminded of, you know, the heights. And if I can only tick those boxes, I'm 100%. Now, these rituals, these avoidance rituals, to him, looked like they were useful because he had a temporary relief when he did them. But as I pointed out, it, it's a bit like a strategy of peeing in your pants to stay warm. Works for a couple of seconds, then it gets really sticky. There's no problem with having a beer, but but if you have to have a beer before you fly, before you fly, that presupposes that you need some sort of crutch. It presupposes that you're in danger and you need some sort of coping strategy, and that keeps the fight or flight system going. So helping people identify these sorts of crutches and helping them to kind of decode or deal differently with the thoughts and feelings that emerge when they begin to violate these avoidance behaviors is extremely useful to begin to turn the fight or flight system off. So these are, these are, you know, things that have been very useful for me in terms of working with clients. There's, there's a final thing. 
and that is that sometimes people create an identity out of something really bad that has happened to them and and they start to you know invest their identity and their sense of significance in being the ptsd victim or being the person who's who's been to war or uh, the one who's been betrayed you know and they they may even begin to orient a lot of their life around that identity and and to even begin to organize a lot of there's social interactions around that. And that can be a trap. Th that can often contribute to people being stuck. So, so that's also a conversation to be had and something to look at. By the way, I'm very thrilled to announce that my only live seminar for the rest of this year, 2023, will be happening in Stockholm, Sweden, October 21st and 22nd. Um, I'll be teaching the Psychological Illusion Model 2.0. So if, you're, if you'd like to learn how I work with clients, and if you'd like to reduce your own psychological suffering, that's gonna be the place to be. So if you're curious about that, and if you want to train with me live, it's better to do these things live, Go to ProvocativeHypnosis.com, hit the seminar page, and you will see the link. October 21st, 22nd, in Stockholm, Sweden, 2023. Also know that I see clients from all over the world on Skype. If you'd like to have a conversation to see if we're compatible as a team, uh, you can reach me at ProvocativeHypnosis.com. Till next time, thanks for listening.